All right, folks, if you are watching online, we will begin our interviews here in just a few moments. Uh, Steve Sisolak is coming out here. He'll go first. We'll see uh, Chris June Kiliani coming up here in just a couple of minutes. But, uh, Commissioner, if you're ready, I'd like ready. to invite you in. Come on in. Thanks, Patrick. I think uh, just first thank off, uh, thank you, of course, for joining us. Just want to get your thoughts now that uh, you went through an hour out there uh, going through a lot of the issues tonight. Uh, just your initial thoughts as this is wrapped up. Well, it was great. We had an opportunity to hopefully get our message out to the viewers and uh, the constituents, what we stand for. An hour went by pretty quickly. There were a lot of issues we didn't cover, and I wish we could have had more time to cover some of them. Uh, I appreciate that. I think that Steve and Denise did a great job in terms of, you know, providing the questions and the answers and look forward to doing it again. I think a couple of the issues that stuck out, one of them, uh, minimum wage, you were at a $10 amount is what you gave. Commissioner June Kiliani gave 15. Uh, is there any point you could be comfortable with that 15 or where did that 10, kind of tell me how you got to that $10 amount. The $10 amount is the number that I've talked to businesses, what they feel that they could afford. When you're talking about $15 an hour, for their, these are not meant to be life supporting jobs, you know, and in addition to that, there needs to be a carve out for tip earners because you've got maitre d's and bartenders and some of the restaurants and hotels that are making, you know, $300, $400 a night in tips. And they should be, there should be a carve out for those individuals when we get to minimum wage. But that being said, if you go to $15, the people that are at $15 have to go to $20 and it goes right up the scale. You will put small businesses out of business. What we've got now is I attended the grand opening of McDonald's on South Las Vegas Boulevard. They install the ordering kiosks and they're eliminating jobs. I don't want to see that happen. I don't want to have it where the kids that just get out of school this week don't have a place that they can go work in the summertime. And if we get too high on that wage scale, that's what's going to happen. You had an answer that surprised me talking about the Board of Regents there toward the end. You'd be in favor of a hybrid system, uh, yet you also talked about a strong chancellor model as well, that you would favor that uh, sticking in place. So uh, why would you be a little more in depth? Why would you be in favor of that hybrid position? Well, because first off, having spent time there, and I got to know a lot of regents, and you get some that are really terrific and do a lot of their homework, and others that, you know, I think get there and don't really aren't as involved as maybe they should be. And I think what you need to hit on the Board of Regents is a certain amount of expertise. If you had 13 people run for the Board of Regents and they're all attorneys, I don't think that would be a good thing. Just like if you had 13 accountants, it wouldn't be a good thing. So I think you need a, uh, a cross-section of our population to have them on the Board of Regents. I don't think, my, I know my commissioner, my colleague said that she thought you should have qualifications. I don't think you should have a qualifications. You should have to be an attorney to run for this one and a lawyer, to, uh, accountant to run for this one, a construction to run for that one. I think that would be a burden. I don't think that would be constitutional, quite frankly. But I do think that you would get more expertise and you'd get people that care about education, not so much concerned about where their basketball or football seats are located. One final question to wrap it up. Uh, Chris June Kiliani was able to answer on, on her side if she would be in favor of appointing school district uh, trustees. Uh, your thoughts on that? I did answer that at the same time I answered the Regent one, that I would be in favor of the similar system as it relates to that, that there should be a hybrid model where you get people of expertise on there. I don't think we'd be in this financial situation that we're in there right now if we had people that had more fin financial expertise on the school board so that we could see these type of situations coming and they could understand the budgeting better. It's a major thing to undertake. These are part-time positions, mm -hmm. the school board and the board of regents, and it's unrealistic to expect that they can consume, absorb, and retain the kind of information that they need in order to move those two systems forward. That's why I'd be in favor of some professional All right. uh, services. Commissioner Sislak, uh, thank you pleasure, much. sir. Thank, thank you very you. much for coming in. Great day. All yeah. right. Thank you very much. Okay. So again, uh, Chris June Kiliani, Commissioner June Kiliani, also will be joining us here briefly in just a couple of minutes. Uh, that full debate we had will just be posted uh, on Facebook and on our website here as soon as we can get that turned around. Uh, coming up in about... Uh, 10 to 15 minutes, if you stay here on Facebook and on the web, we're going to have a full post-debate show. Alan Stock, Annette Magnus, and Steve Sibelius will join me in the studio as we talk about uh, a lot of the answers we had tonight. We'll go over the highlights. We'll have all of the analysis as well. So we want to make sure that uh, you stay focused on that as well. And uh, now we'll bring in Commissioner Chris June Kiliani as well, who is uh, here wrapping things up. Commissioner? Pleasure to see you. Thank you for coming over. I think just uh, let's start with your initial thoughts. Uh, an hour of, of debate out there, a lot of issues uh, were talked about. Some didn't quite get to uh, overall thoughts. 
I had fun. I, it was amazing how fast it went and yet how slow. Mm -hmm. And being a woman standing in heels you know, for an hour is just, you know, hey, we, we can handle all this. I felt very good about it. I thought the questions were very well researched. There were ones we hadn't even prepped for, which is a good thing because I want people to know who we are. They know that I'm a progressive. I was a progressive before it was a word. And so I've gotten things done in Carson City. And I was able to bring that out, that my expertise is there as well. Um, but the main thing is that I'm a special ed middle school teacher. I love kids. I'm still active in the schools. And I know that we can get it done. Talk to me a little bit about the uh, minimum wage answer. So you're, you've been supportive of $15 an hour. Commissioner Sisolak said he's at about $10 an hour to start. Uh, is $15 an hour sustainable right now? Is Nevada ready for that? Our economy is up. Again, as I said, you work with how you implement the plan for moving in that direction. But $15 an hour for a family of four is still not even, it's poverty level. We have to do better than that. We are service-based industry. Our men and women need to be paid a decent living wage, and that's not it. We also need to make sure that we have health care and child care is very key for these individuals, especially our working men and women that are, go that are on that cusp of the working poverty. We didn't get into housing, though. Affordable housing is a huge issue statewide. Northern Nevada has gone into a crisis from 230,000 to 400,000 on average, but it's also your apartments. We need to work with developers and builders to make a better plan on how we're going to make sure we maintain and put in affordable housing for people across the state as well. A lot of talk about education, of course, in the debate as well, several questions, but one of the ones that uh, both of you wrapped up on, we're talking about appointing, uh, excuse me, appointing regents, also appointing school board trustees. Uh, you were different on the opinion. Why? Do you believe that it should stay as is? A little bit more detail, perhaps, than you were able to get into inside. I think the public should still weigh in, and something as special and as important as education, they should be able to go out and talk with those people and put a vote for them. It is the hardest job out there. It's the least paying job out there, but it's also the most important job out there. Why would you want somebody in a back room appointing somebody just to make sure they're doing your bid rather than at least you have an accountability that comes in with the voter box. So I, I don't believe you switch something from a point elected to appointed just because some personalities may not be getting out. I would say for all school boards across the state, no matter who they are, they all care about our children and I bless them for that part of it. I would assume then if you got the, the question as well about the uh, Board of Regents, same answer then. Yes, I might have made them smaller, which I did have a bill to try to make it a smaller board so that there was more collegiality that came into play. Yeah, but I don't think you need to. They already did the bifurcated at the State Board of Ed. It's not necessarily, there's some pros and cons on that part of it. All right, Commissioner Chris June Kiliani, thank, thank you so, so much, much for taking some time. We appreciate you coming and doing the debate with us. All right, thank you. All right, so that wraps things up, of course, for our interviews. Uh, stick around. Coming up in about 10 minutes or so, we'll flip things around, get started in the studio again, as I mentioned. Alan, Annette, and Steve will join me for all of the analysis and highlights from tonight's uh, debate. So we hope you had a good time watching. Much more to come still. So I'll step aside. We'll see you in about 10 minutes. All right. Well, thank you so much for joining us live here on Facebook alongside Steve Sabellius. I'm Patrick Walker. Hey, we are in the books now. Uh, one of our two debates, uh, gubernatorial primary debates, is in the books. The Democrats going tonight. I want to introduce the other half of our panel. Uh, Annette Magnus, the executive director of Battleborn Progress. Thanks she has our me. perspective, of course, from the left. And KXNT radio host Alan Stock, the conservative voice uh, from the right here looking at the panel. So I want to thank you both for taking some time to thank come you. in. Yep, thank you. I want to start over here with Steve first as, as the moderator. Uh, what stuck out for you and just thoughts overall on how this debate went? It was an action-packed hour, and a lot of stuff went in. Yeah, definitely. I, uh, uh, we tried to press for specifics, but a lot of times you're not going to get uh, uh, that specific. We didn't get uh, uh, specifics in terms of, uh, of uh, some of the minimum wage numbers, uh, the, uh, the ESA question, uh, teacher salaries, and the, and the level of how to pay for those, those kind of things. Uh, so I think, yeah, uh, you know, you try to press as much as you can. Uh, but the purpose of the debate, I think, is not only to, uh, you know, show where the candidates stand on the issues, but kind of how they arrive at their decisions so the voters can determine, you know, uh, if they like that way of thinking, if they like how someone reasons their way to a solution for a problem, if their background and experience, you know, kind of helps them uh, reach that uh, conclusion. And I think they saw some of that tonight. All right. So let's, let's uh, talk a little bit about how this debate unfolded uh, from both lenses. Uh, for you two. So Annette, just to, let's start with you. What were 
your thoughts after this thing wrapped up? I thought the debate went really well. I thought both of them did a good job answering questions and really talking about the issues that Nevadans care about. At the end of the day, either one of these people will be a far cry from Adam Laxalt if he were to become governor. Both of these folks are good on, on the issues that I care about as a progressive, but you know, I do think there were moments where Chris G shined in this, and so I was very proud to see both of them debate. Alan, uh, what do you think, uh, looking at this from a little bit different perspective, but uh, you had a chance to hear everybody out for an hour. What did you think? Well, I mean, obviously, they're not representing my point of view, and that's pretty obvious, and so I'm not sure either one would be better than Adam Laxalt or, or Dan Schwartz or anybody else. Um, but I, but I, I do think there were some specifics. I, Steve said there weren't minimum wage. I think there were very specific. Uh, Christian Kiliani made a very clear. She's for $15 an hour. Steve Sisolak said he wants to start at 10 and then incrementally increase that. So, I mean, they, they were they were specific on that. And um, and there were other areas that they were they were specific on as well. I, I they didn't come off as um, uh, as uh, as honorary with each other as I thought that they might be because they were both trying to look as gubernatorial as possible. And I think they both came off a very distinguished in that sense. We'll get into a few of those moments here coming up in just a little bit, but uh, uh, you want to talk about uh, from the beginning, uh, trying to set a tone. So we talked about one October to start, yep. but uh, after talking about the responses from there very quickly, uh, the conversation turned to the NRA when we were talking about taking donations. I want to play a couple of, uh, of their responses now uh, when they were talking about if they refused money from donors and there was a little bit of finger pointing there. So let's take a listen. I did not take NRA money, um, and there are no consequences as far as I'm concerned. You choose who you, who you take money from. Um, I believe that we should be moving towards public financing to try to get some of the fine, the, those types of contributions that are out there. We need to prohibit bundling. It comes down to, though, I'm very proud that in this race, I came in as the underdog. I had to, to try to cobble something together in order to get my messaging out. But I raised nine times more in grassroots lobby uh, um, constituents that have given to me. I will tell you a story. I didn't take any NRA money. They didn't offer me any NRA money, and I didn't solicit any, any NRA money. I didn't take money from strip clubs, as my colleague took money from strip clubs this time around. Uh, I solicited uh, contributions from businesses, from lobbyists, from folks that represent people in our community. I think the gun club issue that you brought up or that Commissioner Judy Okay, so the, the crux of that, this was coming off a money in politics question, Annette. Uh, what did you think of the answers there? The NRA was front and center, but then uh, Steve Sisolak turned around and said, well, Chris G., you took money uh, from strip clubs. And then I think brothels even come up later on. Right. So what did you think about that? Uh, look, I don't see brothels and strip clubs in the same vein as I see gun manufacturers and the NRA. I, I don't. I, I see those as two very different things. Politicians all over the community, whether they're Republicans or Democrats, have taken money from strip clubs and brothels in this community. That's who we are. We're Nevada. The fact that there is questions about whether Steve took money from the NRA or group affiliated with the NRA or gun manufacturers is troubling to me. And I think there needs to be more specific questions around that because I believe that that shouldn't be happening. These, both of these candidates have run very good campaigns um, around the uh, gun issue and around making sure that guns are taken out of hands that they shouldn't be in, making sure we have better gun laws. And so I want more on that answer because I believe that he should have to answer for that if he's going to run on a gun violence prevention campaign. Alan, go ahead and respond. I saw you uh, kind of nodding a little along there. Well, yeah, a couple of things. One, first of all, with the October 1st situation, which started the whole thing off, um, Chris Giuliani said that she would look at sites. That was one of her emphasis, that she liked to look at the sites and see how they're set up in terms of the security. I thought that was a, a good answer on her mm -hmm. part. Uh, Steve uh, Sislak went ahead, and he was the one who, who got the initiative going by saying that he would like to ban bump stocks, assault guns, uh, background checks, and things like that. So he got that aspect of it going, which then led into the NRA issue. By way of disclosure, I am certainly a member of the NRA, very proud member. So let me, having said that, I mean, I just want it as a disclosure. Um, so to me, uh, donating, uh, getting money donated by the NRA would be a, a badge of honor. Neither one of them took money from the NRA. And, uh, and, and Steve Sislak took money from a, from a, a gun club. A lo we have many, many gun clubs in town here which service tourists big, big time. And I, one of those clubs and one of those facilities gave money to him. But I didn't get the idea that he took money from, uh, 
from the NRA or a anyone else. Um, and then he was the one who did, yes, brought up the issue that he hammered a couple times that she took money from strip clubs. And then he did bring up at one time the brothels uh, as well, I guess, of giving her money as, as well.